right, good morning, Victory Family Church. Glad to have you here with us. Oh, good morning. I got a response. <laughs> and those of you online, we're glad you're here as well. We're going to invite you to stand and praise with us this morning. Searching 
to worry about those chains holding us back, that weight holding us back. And we're gonna give some praise for that this morning. There is power 
more time singing that out. There's power. There is power. service. Holy Spirit, let this service be your service. I know we have to schedule, Lord, but I pray that during this service, if you want to speak to it, that we are open to hear from you, Lord. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, and I am excited, and I am thankful for what you're going to do in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. Well, welcome to Victory Family Church. Happy to see everyone's faces. Happy to see everyone here. If this is your first, second, third time in the seat in front of you, there's a connect card. Um, if you're online, there's a connect card at website at victoryfamily.com. Uh, before you're seated, I want you to go to at least four people that you have not said hi to yet and give them a high five, a hug, a chest bump, you know, whatever you feel inclined to. Good morning. morning. With Pastor Datrian, let me welcome you to Victory Family Church this morning. We're so honored that all of you are here to worship the Lord with us today. Trust that you sense God's love for you today and God's presence uh, with you here in this house. In just a few moments, we're going to open up God's Word. 
we're going to discover what he teaches us about faith this morning. But I do want to welcome all of our guests. If this is your first time with us at Victory Family Church, welcome today. Thank you for choosing to be here to worship with us in the house of the Lord today. Uh, maybe it's your second or your third visit. Uh, again, welcome. Thank you for being here today, giving us another uh, check out and, and seeing still what we're all about, seeing if last week was just a uh, an off week or a good week, but we appreciate you being here today. If you are a guest, uh, Pastor Dater mentioned the welcome card in front of you there in the book pocket of the seat in front of you. Sometime between now and the close of the service, you would do us an honor if you'll take a moment and just fill out the little bit of information that's asked for there. It's simply a record of your attendance with us today. You have my promise that we will not hound you or harass you in any way. Uh, you will get a, an email or a card from us, uh, but on the back of that, you can indicate whether you would like some more information about the ministries of Victory Family Church, and we'll be glad to uh, reach out and share a little bit more about uh, some of those interests that you, you might have there. But again, thank you for being with us on your way out this morning. You can take those cards. There are uh, offering boxes on the walls of the exit doors as Victory Family Church comes each week. Uh, faithfully honoring the Lord, our provider. They bring the Lord's tithe and their offerings to the house of the Lord. They leave those uh, deposited there in those boxes as well. You can leave that guest card right there. Also on that guest card, I would say there's a, a place on the back for prayer requests. If you would like us to be praying with you each week, our staff pray through those prayer requests. If you'd like it to be confidential, uh, mark the little confidential box. I will be the only one then that gets that uh, request, but would love to be partnering our faith with you. And I believe in God for the miracle that, uh, that you're trusting him for as well in your life. Uh, this morning, I want to give you just one quick announcement. Next Sunday is Snow Cone Sunday. Now, I would say that's not a national holiday. Google's not going to pop that up on your national holiday calendar. That is something we're doing here at Victory Family. We figure it is so crazy hot. We just need to cool down a little bit. So we're going to have free snow cone Sunday next Sunday after service. Everybody gets a free snow cone and is going to have some good fellowship time uh, cooling off, chilling for a little while, if you will. How was that? Did I just, just embarrass my kids probably when I did that? So how many of you uh, remember or know of the Flintstones? Most of us do. I see, I see a lot of folks that can relate. How many of you liked the Flintstones when you were a kid? Yeah, they were pretty cool, weren't they? So this shocked me this week when I heard this report that uh, not everybody likes the Flintstones. Not every country or continent is as uh, uh, appreciative of the Flintstones as we are. In fact, in the country of the United Arab Emirates, uh, they uh, did a survey of the two largest cities there, and they discovered that the people of Dubai do not like the Flintstones. But the people of Abu Dhabi do. Okay, now if you didn't, if you're not laughing, think about that for just a moment. Abu Dhabi do. And in case your neighbor still doesn't get it, yabba dabba do. Okay. Walk a walk. All right. Anywho, man, I when I heard that this week, I died laughing, and I, I was practicing it last night so I could get it all right for you guys, today. and I practiced it like four times last night, and I laughed every time. I don't know. Just <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm a junior higher still, but anywho, it was fun. So take your Bibles, if you would, and let's go to Mark chapter 10, and if you can believe it or not, we are finishing chapter 10 today. It has been a long journey just through chapter 10, but today we will wrap up. Uh, that chapter of scripture and I move into chapter 11 uh, next week. Now, uh, if you're newer to Victory Family Church, we have been on a study through the Gospel of Mark. I uh, so much enjoy being able to do uh, what is called in technical terms exegetical study and preaching. Exegetical basically is the exegesis of scripture. It means you take a passage of scripture and you you study it within its context and you study it uh, within the verbiage, the words, the, and all of it. You put it all, uh, you study it verse by verse, step by step. So I appreciate and enjoy teaching through books of the Bible, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. Now we do topical teachings and we are on part number 46 
of this series in Mark, we have broken it up a couple of times with some smaller, shorter series in between, and then we come back up and pick up where we left off. But I appreciate this type of study so much. I hope you are enjoying this study, and I hope, as we told you at the outset in part one, our objective, verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, is to get a better understanding of who Jesus is, what Jesus came to do, how he came to do it, who he did it for, how the people received it and responded, and so we can be better at receiving and responding what Jesus has for us today. So this morning we're talking about faith is. Everybody say, faith is. And we discover that uh, Jesus is going to respond to a gentleman's faith this morning. There have been occasions that Jesus did some things for individuals that uh, he doesn't acknowledge their faith in that part. He just does what needs to be done. There are other occasions where Jesus literally uh, acknowledges it is your faith. And this is one of those times today. This event, this encounter we're about to, to read about with Bartimaeus and Jesus, that uh, Jesus recognizes his faith. He acknowledges the faith of Bartimaeus personally and then responds to that faith. And so we're going to talk this morning a little bit about this encounter and discover uh, three important truths about what faith is that catches the attention of Jesus. But faith is important to every aspect of our lives. Faith is really important uh, not only to us as believers, but even to non-believers. I mean, if you think about it, before you were saved and born again, you went to a doctor and you had faith that that doctor was going to prescribe the right thing and not the wrong thing, right? I mean, we, everything is really done by faith. But as believers, our entire existence is wrapped up in the reality that we walk by faith, that we must live by faith. We are born again of the Spirit, and we have this awakening into the things of the Spirit that are unseen, but it's all walking in faith. So let me just lay a little groundwork, give you a couple of scriptures. I want us to read these together as faith builders this morning. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Let's read this one together. God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. God's given each one of us a measure of faith. We can never say, I don't have faith. You might say, I don't have faith for that. You've got a measure of faith. That's implanted in you. Ecclesiastes says there's a part in man that uh, longs for eternity. There is this, this part of man that longs in the heart of man for eternity. There is a measure of faith that we are given. Now look at Hebrews eleven six 6, and let's read it together. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we've been given a measure of faith. It is with that measure of faith that we bring pleasure to God. It's with that measure of faith that we connect with the God activity he has for us and for our lives. And notice what the writer of Hebrews says. He rewards those who seek him. Our faith is a key that unlocks the favor and the provision and the blessing and the anointing and the power of God over our lives so we have a measure of faith with this faith we please God by believing that he will honor our faith and then first John 5 verse 4 let's read it together for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith it's by faith we walk in the victory that Jesus the victorious one brings to us the victorious life that he has for us over sin and death and the grave. And then one more, Romans 10, verse 17. Let's read it together. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith is rooted, folks, in the eternal word of God. That's why I'm super excited that you're here this morning or you're tuned in online to dive into God's word. Faith comes by hearing. And my faith, this measure I'm given, can grow. The measure I'm given can grow for any moment and any time. I'm in a position that I've got to trust and believe with faith. And maybe it calls for a little extra measure of faith in that moment. My faith will grow, that little measure I've been given will grow as I learn God's word. 
as I know what he says, as I discover what he does, and how he does it, and what he promises to do. And then that's where my faith grows. So let's set up Mark chapter 10 for you this morning. And uh, we have the disciples with Jesus, as they have been since about the middle of uh, John chapter or Mark chapter 8. They've been moving toward Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus said, let us go up to Jerusalem. He's told them a couple of times already that he's going to die. He's going to be persecuted. Uh, when they get there, they've had a hard time dealing with that. Uh, he's talked to them about uh, who's first in the kingdom, and the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And he's preparing the disciples. He's done very little public teaching during this time. Uh, to the masses, he's doing it more to the, uh, to the disciples. He's preparing them because in just a few weeks, remember in Mark chapter 8, halfway through Mark chapter 8, we began the last six months of Jesus' life on this earth before his crucifixion. We are now just a few days away from the last week of his life. In fact, we wrap up chapter 10 today. Next week, we dive into chapter 11, and we have the triumphal entry. He's entering into Jerusalem. So he's giving, uh, getting ever closer, and he's teaching his disciples. But, and he doesn't do a whole, we don't, well, it's not that he doesn't do a lot of miracles during this journey uh, to Jerusalem for the last week of his life. We just don't have many recorded, because most of what he's doing is trying to prepare the disciples. But today, we have this unique moment where Jesus does stop, and, and, and he, he performs a miracle for Bartimaeus. Uh, chapter 11 begins they are, are, it begins with them moving into uh, Jerusalem. One of their last stops is going to be the city of Jericho. So in Mark chapter 10, we begin reading there, and it says here, And they came, that's Jesus and the disciples, and they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, and let's stop there. We'll pick back up with Bartimaeus there in just a moment. But let's, let's talk about where they find themselves right now because I think it, it helps us set the, the, the setting and the, and the atmosphere of receiving what God wants to teach us this morning about faith. So they go to the city of Jericho, and it says that they left the city. They go to the city, and it says then leaving the city, he goes out and he sees Bartimaeus. Here's what's important to recognize. They didn't just walk through the front gate of Jericho and leave Jericho out the back gate. They went and they stayed, apparently for a period of time. They went to the city of Jericho, period. And upon leaving Jericho, so there's a time in there that they're most likely, what, they're, what Jesus is doing is taking a time to rest and to prepare himself because he's just a couple of days away. Jericho is about 16 miles from Jerusalem. It's going to be a 3,500-foot ascent up to the city of Jerusalem from the city of Jericho. little side note for you that uh, Jericho, or I'm sorry, Jerusalem is, is built. It's called the, the, the Hill of the Lord, the Mountain of the Lord. It is, it is built up high, and um, when you read in the Old Testament, you read the book of Psalms, and, you know, there's 150 Psalms there, and several of those near the, near the end, uh, you'll see, like in your modern-day Bibles now, you have these paragraph headings, and it'll say Psalm of Asaph, or Psalm of David, or Psalm of Solomon, and then it'll, it'll say Song, S-O-N-G, of Ascent, Song of Ascent. When you see that, just realize what I've just told you, that, that Jerusalem is up on a mountain. These, when you see a Song of Ascent in the book of Psalms, that is meaning that's a song that they would sing on their pilgrimage. They're coming from all over Jerusalem for, fat, for Passover and for Feast of Tabernacles and the various festivals. And as they're traveling, they didn't have satellite radio and they didn't have uh, iPhones and Spotify and Amazon Music or any of that. They sang songs, songs. And these songs of ascent are songs that were traditionally sang by them as they would be ascending up to the city of the Lord. So Jesus has this 16-mile walk. It's going to take him a couple of days uh, to get there. So most likely in Jericho, they are uh, taking a time to rest. And it says there, a great crowd was with him. So consider this. We know the disciples are following him into Jerusalem. We know that uh, uh, there are other disciples. We know at one point in Mark uh, we saw that he sent 72 of them out. We know there's more than that now. So there's a, a crowd following Jesus, but part of the crowd also has to do with the fact that they are only a week away or a little over a week away from Passover. Their great celebration remembering the Passover angel over their forefathers in the land of Egypt when God brought them out of slavery and into, when the chains fell off and they stepped into freedom and then over into the promised land eventually. 
And so the, the crowd is made up also of just tons of people that are making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, would tell us that typically around Passover time, because of so many people coming from the outlying areas, that Jerusalem would more than quadruple in population during that week of festivities. And so there's just a big, huge crowd. Most of these people have heard something about Jesus, if not having seen him do some of these great miracles or heard some of his great teachings uh, weeks or months earlier. So there's just this great crowd following him. Now we, let's go back to 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and he said, call him, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, now notice this is the same crowd telling him to shut up. Oh, hey, 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 take heart, get up. He's calling you, Woohoo! Remember us when you get up there, right? And throwing off his cloak, and remember that, throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Now think about that for a moment. Apparently, Bartimaeus has had a time in his life where he could see physically. He has known a time in his life when he could see colors and he could see faces and he could see smiles and he could see trees and he could see the hills of, of Israel and he could see the, the beauty of the sunset and the sunrise. He had a time that he remembers how things were and he says, Lord, restore, or let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight, and he followed him on the way. Bartimaeus follows Jesus on in to Jerusalem. So let's take a look at three truths this morning about what faith is as we see it exemplified in this encounter with Jesus and Bartimaeus. The first truth is this. Faith is seeing without seeing. It's seeing without seeing. You see, Bartimaeus is blind. We know what that means. He visually cannot see. He lives in complete darkness visually and physically. But he calls out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Bartho uh, Bartholomew, I knew I was going to do that, Tom, because I've done it all week long. It's Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus recognizes something about Jesus. He can't see Jesus. Some in the crowd have been with Jesus for almost three years now. Well, a little over three years, actually. And they've seen Jesus, and they've seen what he's done. They've not only heard him, but they've seen. Bartimaeus hasn't seen. He's only heard, but he hadn't heard Jesus publicly. He's heard of Jesus. But somewhere he has this conviction. He doesn't at first realize who this is walking through town. He just knows there's a big stir. Because it says when he found out it was Jesus, he called out. But he doesn't call out to just Joe Blow that's walking through the streets. Who is this guy? Oh, he's a great whoever. Well, he doesn't call out to just anybody. He says, who is this? And they say, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, him I know of. Him I've heard of. And if what I've heard is true, he can help me. But without eyes to see... He probably sees Jesus more clearly than anybody else in that great crowd. His disciples are still trying to figure him out, right? And they've seen everything you would think a person would need to see. They're still trying to sort it all out. But he cries out, Son of David. Now, I want to help you understand what that title means. 
A few weeks ago, we saw Jesus often called himself the Son of Man, and we talked about what that meant. Son of David is, um, it's really more than Son of Man. Son of Man was, was the term Jesus gave to himself. Uh, though fully God, he wanted them to identify with his personal part of him, his, his human part of him, because to say I'm the Son of God turned everybody off. So he would say, I'm the son of man, which scripturally we saw back in the Old Testament. That was a pointing to the Messiah. Same thing with this title, son of David. David was the great king of Israel. He uh, uh, was told in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he would never fail to have a, uh, a son in his line, a bloodline of his, sitting on the throne of Israel. Now, interesting history fact is Zedekiah was the last king of Israel. And he reigned in about 550 years before Jesus even came. Since that time, there was no king over Israel, yet God had given a promise, I will have David, one of your sons, sitting on the throne of Israel forever. What he was indicating was the Messiah will come from your line, David. And that's why Matthew's genealogy in Matthew 1 is so important for us because it points all the way back to David and then beyond. But God's saying, I'm, you're going to have someone in your line sitting on the throne. It was a messianic declaration. The Messiah is going to be king over Israel. And so for someone to, to use the title son of David means that that person had some understanding of the Messiah taught in the Old Testament. Now, interestingly enough, most likely, Bartimaeus is a Gentile. He is the son of Timaeus. Timaeus is a very familiar Greek uh, name. So most likely, Bartimaeus is not a Jew who grew up in a synagogue school and being taught the scriptures. He's been taught it somewhere, don't know where, but he knows enough of it to know that the title son of David is a, is a regard of the Messiah. So he knows Jesus is not just another rabbi, though he will call him rabbi. He knows and believes him to be the Messiah. So he sees something without actually seeing it. You tracking with me? He sees something without actually being able to see it. He has heard what Jesus has done, what he's been saying, and he's convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, it's interesting to note that Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road. Here's this huge crowd. They're walking through the streets. So you know how it is when you're, when you're sitting down and everybody's standing up around you. you how awkward it is. You're just kind of engulfed, right? I mean, you, you, you just everybody's up and around, and you're down on, here on the ground looking up at everybody's knees. And that's where Bartimaeus is, and it's just what he does every day. Since he's blind, he can't work. And since he can't work, he can't make money. So he's a beggar. Mark even tells us. And, and remember, Mark is, is writing on behalf of Peter. Peter's telling this story to Mark. And Mark's writing it down in the gospel. And Bartimaeus is just doing what he's always done. He's a blind beggar. Has very little to his name. And the only way he gets any sort of income is he has to, to rely on the grace and the mercy of people walking through the streets. So he's just doing what he always does. And his life's about to change radically. Because Jesus, whether we see him acting and working, if we see the results of what we're praying or we don't, Jesus always shows up at the right moment he will always reveal himself let me tell you he is always at work you are never outside of his sovereign care and his activity when the psalmist said your days were ordained for you before one of them came into existence he knows what today holds for you and he's already at work we just don't get to see that physically 
And then at some point when it's the right moment and the right time for the right benefit for his glory, he will reveal himself. But it is always going to be in just your routine. You're going to show up at a routine church service one Sunday and boom, he's going to reveal himself to you as you have been desiring and needing and longing for and praying for and everything's going to change in your worship. Everything's going to change about how you pray from that day forward. He's going to show up on just another given day in your marriage relationship. It is just another day in paradise, living the dream, right? Maybe you're struggling. And it's just going to be another one of those days. Hey, honey, how you? I'm fine. How are you doing today? And he's going to show up. And everything's going to be different in that marriage because something's going to be different about you. I know you're saying, man, I wish Jesus would show up and just straighten that. No, it's going to be different with you. It's going to be different with you. Just in your mundane, routine, quiet time, you have a a discipline each day where you sit and you pray and you have some quiet time with the Lord, devotion time. And it's going to be like any other day and Jesus is going to show up now you've been praying for something you haven't seen any signs of the activity but he's been working all along he's going to reveal himself in it at the right time so Bartimaeus is just doing what he always does it's a normal day for him and then all of a sudden there's this surge of faith That says, all right, if this is Jesus of Nazareth, who I've heard about, let's go for it. Let's just, what do we got to lose? Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, have mercy on me. As with Bartimaeus, it'll just be a normal day. You won't necessarily see the activity of God at work. Always. But your faith sees the activity before the activity is actually manifest physically. That is that is the a part of the beauty of being born again of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. Filled with his spirit, we have this incredible privilege to have a knowledge and understanding and even and a sight into beyond just here beyond what's just right in front of us and so we have eyes we don't always see with these eyes but we see we see Paul would tell us in 2 Corinthians 5 7 we walk by faith not by sight This is a guy who spent a great time of his ministry life, adult life, after coming to Christ in prison and being beaten and tortured and all kinds of stuff, shipwrecked and all kind of stuff going on in his life. And he never gave up because he didn't walk by what he could see. Jesus, where are you in the middle of this prison? Jesus, where are you? He could see Jesus. He's chained and bound, but he's writing the the epistles he's writing half of our new testament from many of those prison cells chained to prison guards and they're hearing him pray they're hearing him worship and he knows he tells us that i know the gospel is spreading through the through into the king's palace even hebrews 11 1 says now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen you see if we can see it it's not faith It is just a fact. I don't have faith that this pulpit's here. I can see it. Now, you can tell me till you're blue in the face, there's no pulpit there. Fake news. You don't get to pick, you don't get to pick your nouns or your pronouns. I'll just throw that out there. It's a fact. The podium is here. If I can see it, that's not faith. It's faith when I can't yet see it, but I see it. 
I see it. Faith is being sure and confident in what you cannot see is coming into your life. Faith is being confident that, that when you can't see it, what God has for you is coming into your marriage. Oh, friends, you may pray a good long time. You may pray for weeks. You may pray for months. You may pray for years. Though what's kept you praying is you see it, you just haven't seen it. And so you keep praying. Faith is being sure and confident that even though you don't see your spouse following Jesus right now or your children following Jesus, you've seen it. You're believing you will see it. If you can see it being yours one day, have faith to believe for it. Now, Bartimaeus encounters a little challenge here. We're still talking about seeing without seeing. You see, he has every reason not to call out the second time. He calls out the first time, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd says, be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. And yet he cries out even louder. You see, he refuses to let the voices of the crowd diminish his faith in who the Son of David is. And you and I are inundated. We are, I'm just going to use the word baptized right now, in all kind of challenging events, news, weather, everything. So much that if you turn on the news, you follow social media and there's so much of it that is overwhelming that we have to make sure we recognize that our faith is seeing beyond that even though we don't see it yet we see beyond we don't let the loud voice steal the faith or diminish our faith in fact, when the news is becoming so unbearable, we shout faith even more. We shout faith even louder. Forget the voice and the noise of the crowd. Shout the faith above the crowd. Apparently, Bartimaeus shouted just loud enough that amongst this great throng, Jesus hears this this cry, this call. Bartimaeus could see Jesus with his heart even when he couldn't see Jesus with his eyes. Say that again. Bartimaeus could see Jesus with his heart before he could ever see Jesus with his eyes. In fact, if he doesn't see Jesus with his heart, I would wager he probably doesn't see Jesus with his eyes. Because Jesus says, your faith, your ability to see me when you could not see me has healed you. Second truth, not only is faith seeing without seeing, faith is knowing without knowing. It's knowing without knowing. Jesus hears Bartimaeus somewhere in the crowd. He's sitting on the ground. Everybody's standing up. The voice has got to carry. He hears this voice in the crowd. And I don't even know. I know Jesus is sovereign. I don't know if Jesus knows this is Bartimaeus. I don't even know if he knows Bar where Bartimaeus in that crowd is. What he does say indicates to us that he hears a cry and he says, call him. He doesn't yell out, hey, you, I hear you. You come to me. He says to the crowd, whoever, wherever this guy is, get him up here. Make way in the crowd. Somebody get him up and help him over here. You may feel like Jesus' lack of response means he's not hearing you. Friends, I believe you probably have, have seen Jesus enough times come through to know that when you thought he didn't hear you then, he really did. And so if you're there again today, remember... Remember when you thought he didn't hear you 
last time and it took a while for him to show himself but he did remember that today remember he does hear you and I told you to remember the cloak anybody remember the cloak did you remember that for me did you put your finger right there in the Bible where it said that here's the importance of this cloak remember it says that when Jesus when Jesus said call him the crowd said hey be of good cheer he's calling for you it says that he in the English Standard Version which I read from it says he sprang up some other translations say he leapt to his feet I mean he doesn't just kind of like oh seriously can't he just come over here to me it's so hard to get up after sitting on this heart oh, wow no he sprang to his feet because he knows something even though he doesn't know what he knows yet. Now, I know that sounds a little weird to you, but follow me. You remember when you were a kid and you asked your mom, Mama, how do I know I'm in love? And you remember what their response was? You'll know, honey, you'll know. And maybe you've used that on your kids. It comes in handy when you don't really know how to explain it. You just know that you know. So it says he sprang to his feet and he threw his cloak to the ground. Now the cloak would be a very familiar piece of clothing to a beggar. Usually it would be about the only thing they owned other than the threads they're wearing underneath the cloak. And the cloak would serve a few things for them if they were without a house and a place to stay in shelter because they're on the streets. The cloak would be their covering at night. And when they're on the streets begging, sitting on the side of the road, full of shame and embarrassed, the cloak would have enough material over it, if not already have a hood sewn into it, that they could pull the cloak up over their head and nobody would have to look them in the eyes and they would not have to look anyone in the eyes and they could just, they could just beg for their alms. And it says that he got up and he threw it on the ground. That What that means is when he works his way through the crowd and they help him get up to where Jesus is, his cloak's still way back over here on the curb. Because somehow, Bartimaeus knew, even though he didn't know. He just knew something was going to happen. And if this is the son of David, and he does what people have said he does, and he's calling for me, Whatever he's about to do is going to change everything. He's crying for mercy. That could mean healing. It could mean, man, God, just, or Jesus, just help me. Just lay a $500 bill right in the bucket here. I don't know what, what he means by mercy, but Jesus does say, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I, I, want, to re, I, I want to recover my sight. That's what I would really, really like. And so Bartimaeus leaves the cloak knowing that something is about to change. He doesn't know what exactly, but if this Jesus has called him out of the crowd, it's going to change. And can I just tell you this morning, friend, Jesus has called you out. He has called you out and redeemed you with his blood. And the scripture says he has filled you with his Holy Spirit, a seal, a guarantee, sealing you into his promises, his power, his protection, his provision. He has called you. And by calling you, you can be guaranteed something's going to change. Things are going to change. You see, I, I absolutely believe that when, when we are born again, when we truly repent of our sin and we recognize how our sin is, is offensive to God, our Creator, and how it's separating us from Him. And we choose to believe the truth of Jesus, that He is the Son of God who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we are born again by surrendering our life, taking up our cross, and following Him. We are born again. Jesus said you will be born of the Spirit. I am absolutely convinced you cannot be born of the Spirit and keep doing what you always did. Because the new Spirit in you isn't the old spirit if you repented the old spirit died in that moment 
and you are alive to the Spirit, desires change. I've told you before, when, when I got saved at, at the age of 21, I felt like I could breathe. I remember that night, November 13th, 1981. And I remember at that altar just, it was like I could breathe because it literally now, I didn't know it then, but I've studied the scripture enough to know what was being lifted was this whole weight of sin that I was living under and, 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 and keeping in my life. And I felt that release. Things change. When we're praying, and we're praying with faith, and we, we have eyes that see without actually seeing, there comes a part and a place and a moment where we have this knowing without actually knowing. We know he's going to do something. We know he's capable, and he will. You see, throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been telling us all to leave something. Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Give up your life to follow me. He said, anyone who's not willing to, to give up their mother and their father and their brothers and their sisters is, is, not, is not able to follow me all the way through into the kingdom. So he's been telling us to give something up. And, and Bartimaeus, maybe he heard something about that somewhere, but, but his is a response that's just an immediate, throws it off and says, Jesus... What are you going to do? What do you want to do? He knows Jesus can. He knows Jesus will. And he knows that whatever Jesus chooses to do in this moment is going to change everything. Faith, your faith, is knowing that as well. That Jesus can, Jesus will, and whatever he chooses to do will change everything. When you've been praying and you've been believing... Jesus will step into your normal day-to-day -day and everything will change. He's the Lord of new things. The old is gone and the new has come. The book of Revelation, he says, in the end of it all, I make all things new. So let me ask you this morning, what is your faith calling you to let go of or to leave behind in order to take a step toward what Jesus wants to do. What do you know that you don't really know yet? What can Jesus do in that marriage? What can he do in your, your personal life? What can he do in that grief? What can he do with that son or that daughter or that spouse? What can he do with your finances? What can you do with your heartache and your brokenness? Faith is seeing without seeing. It's knowing without knowing. And thirdly, faith is asking without acquiescing. Faith is asking without acquiescing. To acquiesce means to be reluctant, means to be passive, means to just accept it, and, but reluctantly. He's not asking reluctantly. And prayer is not asking reluctantly. Prayer is asking boldly. It's asking confidently. Jesus called Bartimaeus out of the crowd. Well, and, and the crowd looks at him. Watch this. And the, the crowd said, hey, take heart. He's calling you. That, that phrase, take heart, literally in the Greek means to have courage. They're saying to him, hey, have courage. He's calling you. And so when he gets, when Bartimaeus gets to Jesus, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Is it possible Jesus is very willing to do more than you even ask, think, or imagine? You see, I can tell you this for myself personally, and I told you last week about this cell of our home and feeling very selfish in my prayer and had to change the way I was praying. It's easy to feel like we shouldn't be asking for certain things. Maybe we don't feel worthy. In fact, 
maybe we aren't worthy. We're only worthy by the fact that we have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are his redeemed. So he looks at Bartimaeus and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Wow. That's got to be powerful. If Bartimaeus is seeing without seeing and he's, he's knowing without knowing that this is the son of David who can heal the sick and the lame and do all those things I've heard he's done, he's writing me a blank check. Now, he doesn't just ask for anything. Jesus is writing him a, a blank check. Yeah, load me up with millions, Jesus. This whole begging thing's just barely getting me by. But you could load me up with a bunch. No, he's, he knows what he wants. He prays pointed. He prays pointed. Does Jesus ask him, what is it you want? I would say more of our praying should probably be more specific. Bartimaeus says, I want my sight restored. I want to see. I want to see again. But he asks with confidence. There's this, this assurance in him. There's this boldness. Sometimes we don't pray with much confidence. Maybe we don't have confidence in our ability to pray the right words. Maybe we don't have confidence in our ability to be pleasing to Jesus, to think that he would actually respond to our prayers. And all of that is nothing more than strongholds in our thinking that keep us from approaching the very one for whom nothing is impossible. Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy, and watch this, and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us with confidence go to the throne of grace and ask. And the confidence we have is not in our right words, and it's not in our ability to please Jesus. It is in the fact that he has washed us in his blood. God has been pleased with the sacrifice of his son that we have chosen to be the sacrifice for us and put our faith in. And so God says, I welcome you. I welcome you to approach me. I welcome you to let me know your need. Because I have grace. And that word grace, we, we, we know that his grace to save us is that he, he gave us the great gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And the grace is that we don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyway. But, but grace also, in the Greek, is the word that, that means multifaceted. It's a multifaceted word. In 1 Peter, it says, uh, each one should use whatever gift he has received, faithfully administering God's grace to others. Grace is used in the spiritual gifts, a multitude of various gifts. So what it's saying is my grace, whatever is needed, God says, feel free to approach me with confidence in Christ and ask. James would go on to tell us we have not because we ask not. We're not making our prayers known to the Father. And then 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. According to his will, he hears us. Now, that's where we get tripped up, isn't it? This is where we're at with our house situation. We have this house we really think we like. We do. We don't know if Jesus does yet because he hadn't given us either way yet. So kind of like a fleece, we just kind of laid it out there and said, you can close the door at any time. I'm just getting frustrated enough that I need him to hurry up and decide which one he's going to do. It's just, and he and I have come, had some come to Jesus meetings about my attitude. And I'm pretty sure as soon as I get my attitude straightened up, we'll know what we're supposed to do. But 
we don't always pray with this, this confidence because we're not sure what his will is. And I will say this. Faith comes by hearing. We said it or read it earlier. And hearing by his word. When I can know his word, I can understand his will better. Oh, there will still be some areas that, that he hadn't revealed it to me yet. But you see, when I, when I know his word, when I've studied his word, when I've read his word, when I've memorized his word, I know what he does based on his word. I know what he says. I know what he promises. So, Lord, in accordance with what I know you've said, what I know you've promised, I'm praying. I'm praying for this healing. I'm praying for this loved one's salvation. I'm praying for this provision. I'm praying for the protection of my, my household. And in John 15, 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, there's another tricky one. So we get tripped up. What is his will? In this idea of wish, okay? So that word troubles me when I read that. And the reason it does is culturally, we don't, we, you know, we know you can't treat Jesus like a genie in a bottle. And yet sometimes our prayers may come across that way. Our attitude in prayer may come across that way. So I, I, I did some research on the word wish there in, in, in the Greek and, and what it means. And it means to ask what you're inclined to ask. What you are inclined to. What is it in your heart? That you feel the need is what is it in your heart that you want to see Jesus do so you're not wishing as we know the word wish in the English language you're speaking what your heart is inclined to when Jesus asked Bartimaeus what do you want me to do for you he's asking Bartimaeus what's in your heart tell me when you say have mercy what is this mercy you want look like what are you asking for Friends, I, I absolutely believe this morning that Jesus asks each of us, what is it? When you pray and you don't really know how to pray, what is it you're asking for? What is it you're looking for? What is it you want me to do? And again, this knowing without knowing is we know he's going to do something and we're going to let him do what he wants to do because he knows far better than what we may know in the moment. We don't know what we, what we don't know yet. And what's interesting in wrapping this up is that Bartimaeus, it says, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Bartimaeus, it says, gets up and he followed Jesus. To the best of our understanding, Bartimaeus followed Jesus all the way to Jerusalem. We don't know much about or anything really about Bartimaeus after this, but here's an interesting fact that we just read it in Mark 10. This same event of Bartimaeus being healed is recorded by Luke and it's recorded by Matthew. Matthew tells us there were two beggars sitting on the side of the road. Matthew does not tell us their names. He just says there were two beggars. Mark tells us one of those beggars was named Bartimaeus. Now remember, where's Mark getting his information to write this letter? He's getting it from Peter. Who is Peter? Peter was one of the guys right there next to Jesus when he called for Bartimaeus. Peter references the name Bartimaeus. It's believed by, by many historians that as Bartimaeus would follow Jesus into Jerusalem, the reason his name would be included in this gospel is that the readers of the gospel, the letter that Mark wrote, approximately 12 to 15 years after Jesus ascended back to heaven, would know the name Bartimaeus. There's no other reason to name him except that his name would be familiar to people because it's believed that he went on to become a part of the early church, the first century church, perhaps even to the point of being instrumental in the spreading of the gospel. 
and people would know his name. Peter, who was certainly instrumental in the first century church, knew him by name and remembered him. So somehow, most likely, Bartimaeus, by leaving his cloak on the ground and following Jesus, was an instrumental part of the church. From beggar to instrumental. And he laid that cloak down, seeing without seeing, knowing without knowing, and asking without acquiescing. And it did change everything. That's the faith. But I would say this morning, Jesus recognizes. Seeing without seeing, knowing without knowing, and asking without acquiescing. This morning, I would ask us, by way of application, Lord, what are you, what are you saying to, to me this morning personally? Let me ask you this. Does the measure of faith you're operating in right now, does it allow you to pray a big prayer right now? Are you reluctant to ask for what's truly in your heart for that marriage or for that situation that you're in, for that, those finances or for that new job or... Do you, does your faith level right now allow you to ask big? And, and I would say this, that if it doesn't, then hearing, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, hearing this word this morning, the Lord says, stretch your faith. Pray a big prayer. Pray a big prayer. And pray it with confidence. And another question is this. What is your faith prompting you to do right now? What's the step into what Jesus is doing and has for you? What's the step you've got to take? And this morning, if you're, you're here, you're online, or you're hearing this later by recording, the first step of a faith that Jesus honors is a, is a step of faith to follow him. And he calls all of us to lay down our lives to follow him. And I would say this morning that if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've seen, said, or experienced, Jesus calls you out of the crowd to lay down sin, to lay down your past, to lay it all down, and to come follow him. The word of God says, the wages of my sin is death, but the gift that God gives me through Christ is eternal life. And that eternal life is not just in the sweet by and by, it starts now that I'm born again. You can be born again, friend. Literally, you can change. You can be changed. Let me put it that way. You ain't changing yourself. You've tried that. That's why you're frustrated today. You can't change yourself, but you will be changed if you will put your faith on Jesus Christ and choose to follow him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word today, for the power of your word. Your word is life-giving, Father. You said you would send your word and it would accomplish everything you've sent it to do. It would not return back to you void. So, Father, this morning my prayer is that faith across this room has gone to a new level today. I pray, Father, that we will take a step of faith, whatever you're calling each of us individually to, as individuals or as families, even as a church, Father. We would take the step of faith that we know to take. At the beginning today, Father, your church, we will begin praying the prayers that are, that are on our heart, Father, with a confidence that you welcome us to bring those requests to you. May prayer rise to a new level in our personal lives and within our church, Father. We ask, Lord, that you will teach us 
teach us how to see without seeing, how to know without knowing, and how to ask without acquiescing, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Lord, for any this morning, within the sound of my voice, who don't have that personal relationship with you, I pray today they would know today is the day of their salvation. As you've revealed your love to them, your truth to them, now, Father, may you give them a heart of courage to give their life to you. Thank you, Father. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We are, as we typically do, going to close with a song this morning. We intentionally moved our prayer time to this point in our service this morning from when we may typically do it. Because I wanted this faith to be built up. So as we ask each Sunday, and we give the open opportunity, if you're here this morning in this service, and you have a need, you have something you're believing the Lord to do, or maybe you didn't even know you had a need till you heard this word this morning from Jesus, and you're realizing, this is what's in my heart. I just haven't been asking him. Well, now's the time. Now's the time. And you're in the house of the Lord. Jesus said he called it a house of prayer. So we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray with you this morning. And so I'm going to invite you, if you're here this morning and you have something you're believing the Lord for, big, small, it does not matter, what's inclined in your heart to see the Lord do? What do you know you need Him to do? What do you think you know to need Him to do? But with an open heart, you'd come and you'd say, Lord, do what you want to do. So I'm going to invite you to come, if you would, real quickly. We're not going to wait till the song starts. I want you to come this morning. Join me right here at this altar. What are you believing the Lord to do? What do you see that you know He can do? And what are you willing to ask Him? What are you willing to ask Him? And why don't we go ahead and step a little closer so others can come in behind us this morning. And I'm going to ask our prayer partners that are with us. There are a few that are out this morning, but I'm going to ask our prayer partners that are with us to come take the anointing oil. And as we, the rest of us, worship, your worship creates an atmosphere for the presence of the Lord. He inhabits the praises of his people. So our worship is as instrumental a part of what God wants to do for folks at this altar this morning as anything. So you worship. If you need prayer, you can come on down at any point in time. If you don't need prayer, you be those who stand like it was with Moses. You had Aaron and Hur lifting the hands of Moses in intercession, and Israel won that battle. You're those who are holding the hands of these this morning that are here for prayer through your worship. So let's continue with our hearts open to the Lord. At this altar, you worship the Lord, and you give that need to the Lord. We're going to come, and we're going to, we're going to pray with you. Who all do I have here? Mimo, where are you at? You right there? All right. Got Daytrain over here. Is Robert with us this morning? Lisa here this morning. I don't see Robert or Lisa. All right, so we will get to you. You just continue to worship and praise and pray, and we will make sure we get to you this morning. Let's worship the Lord.
as we leave this place he goes with us today we go in faith as we go
go with our four pillars of faith. All right, Natrian, you ready to do this? Natrian's going to lead us this morning as we prepare to dismiss in our four pillars of faith. Alicia and I will be in the foyer this morning. If you're a guest with us, please take a moment, stop by and say hi. We have a little special gift for you today. Here's your pillars of faith this week. Let's rock this thing, man. I love it. I love it. All right, our four pillars of faith. I want you guys to say it with me so I don't want to be the only one saying it with us. All right? So God is good. Jesus forgives. The Spirit empowers. All things are possible. Amen and amen and amen. I want that to be our pillars of faith for this coming week. Amen? Amen. Well, we hope you guys have a great week. We love you guys, and we will see you next week. Thank you.